Welcome to the Startup Artist Podcast, Indie Film TL's podcast. And this week we got a great interview with this guy named Charles Officer. He's a fantastic filmmaker from Toronto. And we're talking about how do you get funding for your film, obviously. What are the other sources of revenue for your film? How do you get actors in your film? How do you get agents and casting directors interested in your film? What gripes does he have with the industry? How does he pitch? And what is his success to failure ratio, let's say the batting average of his pitching. One thing is that the audio is not ideal and I couldn't get the fans in the background to stop their motorized noise and so you'll hear that, but you're sexy and you're smart and you're wonderful so you can push through all of that. Enjoy and learn and take action. I am here with Charles Officer, a really interesting filmmaker from Toronto, pretty much self-made, right? Yes, yeah, yes. Well, okay. with, with the help, with, with a little help from some friends, for sure, but yes. So we're going to talk about how did he get to the level that he's at where he's able to produce documentaries and even narratives yes. for, like, the CBS and for one premiered at TIFF, I believe. Yeah, I've, I've had a couple of films play at TIFF, yeah. So how did he get from the level that he was at before? We're going to talk about where he was to where he is now. So, Charles? Yes. How are you? I'm good. How are you, man? I'm really good. Good, good, I'm good. Happy. You're such a jolly guy. Uh, you said that before. Yeah, I, well, I mean, um, yeah, I think uh, there's no no reason why not to be, <laughs> really. You know what I mean? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just me. <laughs> so, here's one thing that I always say at Indie yes. Film TO, which is 80% of your success is your psychology. Mm -hmm. 80% of your chokehold is your psychology. Mm -hmm. Now, you seem to be very, again, joyous and jolly. Is that something you work on every day, or is that something that you just were born with? How did you get to this level? Yeah, you know, I think, um, I believe that about psychology and sort of success and, and what it takes in terms of your mental endurance, but um, I'm just who I am. I just, I was, you know, I, I was raised a certain way. I have my experiences. I've, I've, I've seen how other things and other people roll, and, and I just try to, you know, beat to my own drum that way. I think that... Uh, I played a lot of sport when I was young. I played a, a lot of hockey at a very high competitive level. So it's... Um, that's how you know this is Canadian. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's how you know it's Canadian. Black uh, boy <laughs> with hockey. the last name Officer playing hockey in East York. Anyway, um, in this city, I mean, that's that's the way you have to hang with, with, with some people. Is there some... earn some respect, you know? You have to play the game that, that, that people in your neighborhood were playing and get better than them. And school them. <laughs> so, and does so, that yeah. carry over into your films? Do you feel competitive in your filmmaking that you're like, I want to make a film that's better than so and so, or do you just compete with yourself? I compete with myself. I don't compete with anybody else. Um, uh, that is uh, what I learned a lot from playing competitive hockey, which is a team sport. Um, and sort of the psychology, your physicality can be one thing, but it's it's your mental toughness that has to be. Um, sharp and they have to be developed and, 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 and that's what you work on every day um, and that level of focus but it's like I don't compete with uh, um, especially with filmmaking I found it very interesting that you know as I started very early on in, in that sort of space I found other people around me were were competitive with me and and I always found it fascinating because we would never make the same thing we don't eat the same food so what are you actually competitive about? Like me maybe getting financing or me getting an award or me getting to a festival and you not. Like it's, it's a very fascinating thing. I don't compete with a single person in the film industry in no stretch. I, I'm my hardest critic and I, I compete with myself. Yeah. Do you do something on a daily basis that sort of you feel primes you for success or do you have a writing ritual? What rituals? you got yeah I think uh, the rituals are hard to find when you first start because I think you know for myself I didn't go to film school I didn't have you know I, I made a short film and then gone to the Canadian Film Center and it was a different level I had a lot of catching up to do even though I got into this program but um, <clears throat> it takes a while to develop your rituals and I, I, I take I'm uh, very fortunate in, in, in my journey to have met some amazing people individuals who are were senior uh, and have a lot more experience. Uh, one, for example, is Chris Haddock, who created Da Vinci's Inquest, Romeo's Section. And you met them at the CFC? No, I didn't meet him at the CFC. And just I'm, so for people who are who yeah. have no idea what the CFC is, the Canadian Film Center is uh, a film um, uh, hub uh, institution that was founded by one of our greatest filmmakers. I mean, 
on the planet, uh, Storm and Norman Jewison, sorry, just Norman Jewison. Um, he started this place, um, I think it was in the late, late 80s, early 90s, where um, it became an incubator for filmmakers. Filmmakers to train that are, but they're not out of film school, but more in the professional sort of space. So, which, which means, which means you've made a film or two. You've played a, a, at a at a you know notable film festival. You may have already made a feature film. Um, you know, you 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 may be working in television. It's like you know. It's, so that sounds to a lot of people who are listening. Yes, those people don't need coaching. They've already made it. Well, no, no. It, it, this is the thing about it. It's like you know. Um, that's not necessarily true. I mean, you your work is on a certain level, but you know, in this country, you're always needing an extra level of, of push or support, and it's a platform. Uh, the Film Center created uh, created this this idea that they're going to select you know x amount of in my year eight directors from across the country, and you incubate for a year together, you know, and you work them on filmmaking, and and but it's but you're also learning, you know. Um, Everything on the profession, you're meeting, you're connected with people in the industry and pitching your projects to on a on a, on a higher level. Like it's uh, it's the more the immediate direct, you know, you could be running around as a filmmaker trying to get a meeting or trying to get your script in front of you know a broadcaster network through the film center. It was all arranged in the program that you were actually constantly meeting people that were really really out there from folks, you know, Christine Vachon who runs, you know. Um, uh, is a great producer in the United States and, and has made amazing films. They bring her in. You get to connect with people that way. But that's what the film center is. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, my year, I had like Brad Payton in there. Sarah Pauly was in that year. Brett Sullivan was in that year. It's like it was a very strong group of young directors. Yeah. But I was about 25 when I went there, right? Yeah. Like 20, yeah, around there, 25, 26. So it's like, yeah, it, you know, so you're not coming right out of film school going there. Yeah, it's very rare. But it's, um, yeah, yeah, that's what the film center was. And you started off not doing films, but you said that there's a certain pedigree to get, even to get into the CFC. Absolutely. And I mean, what did you do to get into the CFC? What I did was, I made a film. I made, I was, I guess, <clears throat> I guess for myself, I was very fortunate because uh, I'd only made one short film. And, you know, some people have made two or three, and some people have applied three times or two times or whatever I was very fortunate that you know the first short film that I made which I made when I was while I was a creative director I was a graphic designer first and um, went away to theater school in New York and then uh, was really inspired while I was there and looking around the, the students of 40 between two classes that they take once a year and then the second year they cut it down to just 20 I was the only black guy in the, the year of 40 students international. In graphic design? No, no, no. This is when I went to theater school. Okay. So I had already been a graphic designer, and then I took a leave of absence for a year um, to explore this theater school stuff and see if I even was, was yeah. thinking about making any transition in that. It's a longer story, to, a little bit of a longer story, like why that even happened. But while I was there, I realized that, because I wasn't going to like just stop be my profession, yeah. what I've worked to school for, to just suddenly just go off and try to be an actor yeah. when I was quite aware at that time watching films and being an appreciator of cinema and stuff although I wasn't wasn't that there weren't many people of black men in films or TV yeah. so I was like well what am I getting myself into maybe I should make a film and act in something first if this, before I'm like you know quitting my job and making this big shift so while I was in New York at that time I wrote my first short script which I was just going to act in just to find out if I liked acting. Yeah. And um, it was a bit, it's three actors in it. I envisioned it very, very simply. I was going to shoot it like it was six or seven pages. And it was just this little st- personal story. Cool. So I interviewed four directors uh-huh. to direct this film. Yes. And the woman who changed my life for the reason why I'm even doing any of this, we're speaking with you about this stuff today, is a woman yeah. named Jacqueline McClintock. And she told me when she read the script, you have to direct it. And I said, well, how could I direct something and be in it at the same time? She said, you're smart enough, you'll figure it out. That's all she said. Yeah. So eventually, after this little project went through this process of trying to find a director, all I wanted to do was find if I liked acting. Yeah. And and this little seven-page script to someone else turned out to blow up to 50 pages, and they're telling me I need $350,000 to make this thing. A short film or a feature now? Well, he blew up to 50 pages. It's still not a feature. So I'm like, this isn't... 
right. Like, where do you get three hundred and fifty thousand dollars? This is a very small idea. It doesn't have to be that. So, anyways, long, I brought it all back yeah. to myself. Went back to the original story and applied for a grant. And I was very lucky to get it. For how much? I got five thousand dollars, and um, two thousand of that went to the re- to the repairs of the cube van that I smashed up because I didn't know what size of van to get, what kind of, what I needed to actually get to carry the equipment, this film equipment that I don't know about. Yeah. I didn't even know what a tripod really looked like. I didn't know what kind of lights and what, I didn't know what capacity of van I needed to transport this This is the caliber of person that we're dealing with here. So back then, so if you think that you have no skill level where you're at, where you're at, he didn't know what a tripod was. I didn't know how to skate before I learned how to play hockey, right? So you got to learn how to skate first. Yeah. So I rent this truck that's way bigger than I needed. All the equipment took up this much space in the truck, and I couldn't drive a, a cube van. I didn't know how to drive, but I drove it anyway. S- put a hole in the roof, put a hole in the side, smashed up the freaking um, side view mirrors. When I returned the vehicle out of that grant, is what I'm saying, yeah. 2000 of that money, the grant went to, to, repairing, to repairing and the insurance for that yeah. van. So I had $3,000 to finish this film. That was originally 100 times that budget, three, 350 well, that's what someone else wanted to do. Okay. You get it? So yeah. another director read my story, the seven pages, and decided that their vision of expanding this little story that I wrote yeah. blew up to 50 pages and that it would need $350,000. Now, now that's, this is interesting because a lot of people who are listening to this, mm-hmm. and I get emails from people that say, I have a, fil- I have a film, I'm a first-time filmmaker or mm-hmm. second-time screenwriter, and it's a $2 million feature easily. And I'm like... Get real. First of all, I don't know. I don't know why they're <laughs> telling me like they want funding for me. Like I have millions to just give them. Get real. But, but second, like yeah, for anyone out there who's that arrogant or think, and I'm being, I'm, I'll be crass and straight up with you. Any first time filmmaker or person out there right now listening to what I'm saying, who's arrogant enough to think that their idea, without even making a film or a feature or even know what it feels like, that they're going to get two million dollars, or that they're going to have, like, wake up, wake up. Wake up. You got to work it. You got to know how to make uh, a short film first. You got to know how to make a film. Yes. So why do you think while you're sitting there whining, while you're trying to go out there and raise uh, millions of dollars, while you think your skills and your project is worthy of that? What have you done? What have you done? Yeah. How do you expect to become a pro athlete and not even play in the junior leagues? If somebody just walked in right now, they would think you were, you were mad at me. No. You were just I'm just me. talking. I'm just passionate about it. Yeah. It's just like, I'm, who cares what other people think? You know I'm not. Yeah. So it's like, get, let's get real out there, people. And this is, I'm, I'm talking to you because I'm talking to you directly in front of me, but I'm talking to this, anyone yeah, who's listening. Exactly. It's like, and, and I want to be that direct. Like yeah. I'm imagining someone else sitting in front yeah, of me. Yeah. Who's coming to me and saying, hey man, I got this project. Why don't you help me raise like a million dollars? Yeah. Okay, well show me the work. How good is the script? Who are you going to attract to be in this film as an actor? Yeah. You know? So here's what, they will, here's what they tend to say. Yeah. You just said, okay, do the work beforehand. We're going to talk about what work mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you got to do beforehand mm-hmm. before you get to a level of, let's forget about $2 million, Yes, let's say, for sure. Let's say two hundred k. Sure. Okay, that's a very reasonable thing. You want two hundred k. What work do you got to do to get to two hundred k? You got to make a film. You've always got to make stuff. Yeah, okay, let's, say, let's right? say they've made shorts and maybe even a feature. Sure. A feature that's like 50K. Sure. 10K. A hundred, like no, not hundred k. Beneath, beneath fifty. Beneath, beneath fifty. Yeah. So okay. So if you if you feel like you've made a couple of short films, they're solid enough. You've got some festivals or not, whatever. You feel like you're ready and you have a script that you really believe in that is strong and and you've and you've and you you and your producer are, are are you know sitting around and you're like you've 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 you've, you've built a little finance plan how you're going to re- find the money yeah. not just through Indiegogo yes. or whatever yeah. or crowdfunding yeah. like a financial plan yeah. you know like where can you go and source this money can you go to the OMVC can you go to Toronto Arts Council can you go to Ontario Arts Council can you go to the Canadian Ca- Arts Council yeah. what do you qualify for can you go to t- can you go to Telefilm for their emerging uh, low budget filmmaking funds yeah. you know those are the places that you have to look at and look at how much money you can possibly gain from these sort of outlets, these financial sources, and put it in a financial plan. And then you go through your list. You have to apply for it. We're lucky we live in a country where we actually have this. Yes. 
but we can't just think of relying upon that. You still have to be innovative in, tour, in terms of, well, if, if, if uh, you know, the Ontario Arts Council doesn't come in and I, don't, and, and I need 10000 from them, where am I going to find that 10000 Yeah. Then you have to be innovative in thinking, well, do I have to look at my project and my script and scale it down? Or do I have to go out and find someone else? So therefore, will I go to a post-production house and give them equity in my film so that you can actually take off ten thousand dollars in terms of post costs. Right. Let's and find those investors. You let's know? go through some unconventional ways. So that's kind of I'm considering it unconventional because the traditional way a lot of people would just do would just be apply for grants. And right. then really which really means they apply for two or three, get denied and think, okay, none of the grant the grant the whole grant system's broken. Which I actually do believe the grant system's kind of broken. But not to the point where I'm not going to apply for like every single grant that I right. have available you, you, to me. Right? right, right. Okay, so let's say you've done some pitching to grants and mm. you've even done some crowdfunding and all that stuff and you've run out of family money. So what are some other sources of revenue for your film that you want to get to about 200K, let's say? Well, you have, <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the post-production. You have sound and you have picture and um, they're distributors out there. Yeah. Right, so if you if you if you are still trying to raise money to go into production, uh, to shoot the film to get it in the can, that's where you should you know you're going to have to be setting up post deals anyways. So you can actually you know whichever post house you're working with or you're trying to build a relationship with, you're going to them and pitching your project to possibly see if they can come in, as well as equity partners, you know. So they will actually invest a little bit of money in your film, but then they're going to become stakeholders yeah. in that film. Um, and then you can get a deal with your post-production, whether it's sound or picture. Um, you know, for smaller films, I mean, <clears throat> distributors are tricky, right? Because for films of that budget range, they can't see initially that knowing that it's at that, that range, you're not going to have sort of a cast or a, a, or someone that's, that can justify them spending X amount of money on your project. Yeah. So that's the reality that you have to understand is that, you know, when you're emerging filmmaker, your film, your first feature film is to kind of let people know what you're about. Yeah. What kind of films you want to make. And then you have to start to think about how you actually penetrate a marketplace with your next film. You have to earn those stripes a little bit. So your you know? first feature, almost think of it as just the calling card. Well, yeah, you want to be great, but you know, you, but you can't, you it, the best film you can possibly make, but you have to, it becomes a signature, something that you can actually show people that you can that you can get two million the next time. Yeah, or five million. Or you know that you know you know how to make a movie. Yeah, right. And that will attra- and then you can go to a distributor, you know, for your next film and start to talk to them early about your next project, and then they can come in with X amount of dollars. But then the demand on that when you talk with distributors is that you need. You, you need, for lack of a better word, you need a star. You need someone yes. with, you need to, and, and these people have to want to work with you, right? Yeah. You, stars don't just come out of the woodwork to work on any old film. Yeah, so how do you, you get ha- that? Well, you, it's, it's based on your work, especially as a first-time filmmaker. Your work has to speak to a certain individual so that when you are sending your next script and they're looking at your work, your past, your the film that you've made, they're like, wow, this person's interesting. I want to work with this person. I trust putting my 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 hands and my skills in this person. And maybe I'll I'll take a little bit less because I really, really like this project and believe in this 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 creative um, you know, visionary or something. And how did that that yeah, that actor, whether it's B list, C list, A list, how did that actor even get to see it to begin with when you're just a first time filmmaker and you're just maybe screening it at in some local theaters or it's just getting minor festival play how do you get into the hands of actors it's tricky um because you know we have these film festivals and they hype films and and people are there and people hear about things some films obviously go under the radar a lot of them do you know of a certain size um but if you are trying to pursue you know a larger film where you're having cast in mind of a certain caliber and you're thinking about that for your second film or even your first film, I mean, you are going to need help. You're going to need to be in touch with, you know, agents. You're going to have to cold call some people and let them know who you are. Yeah. You might have to reach out to, you know, a casting director in Los Angeles or here and and get into the conversation with them and let them know about your work. You have to show them your stuff. 
you know, all you have is your work is to, when you want to meet, even with a cinematographer of a certain caliber that you want to work with that's excellent, you have to be able to show them your work. So call so, casting directors and call agents. Well, yeah, I, I think, I think, well, that's the only way to get at, like, that's the only way you're going to get at a caliber of actor. Yeah. You're, it's not going to be, unless you have a friend of a friend. And, and you call them and you just say, hey, my name is so-and-so. Yeah. And then, and I have a film, a feature film. Yes. And uh, I just want, what, what would you say? Well, you, 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 you want to engage in a conversation with them about your project. You want to give them X amount of information about it. You know, you don't want to be, like, sending the script on the first email. You want to know if they want to actually engage with you first. Yes. Yeah. Right yeah. and give them an opportunity. So a short synopsis, a short a short introduction of who you are and what you're about, and what your intentions are. Yeah, a little synopsis, and then inviting them to have a conversation with you further, and getting on the phone with saying them. something like, "Hey, we'd like to take you out for coffee for fifteen minutes." Well, or? I don't know if you can take everyone out for coffee because what if they're in another country? Yeah, right. I'm Virtual saying you know, over Skype or well, just phone yeah, call or email. phone call, a phone call, Skype. I mean, a phone call is 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 uh, is magical. That's all people used to do back in the day, you know. They would pick up the phone and call and have a conversation and talk about what the, what their intentions are, yeah. right? So I think I think for you know that's a very simple thing, but you but you have to invite people and let people know about. And they may say, hey, well, do you have a link of some of your work? I'm really curious to see some of your work before we engage with this. It's like, yeah, here's a link to my short film, my feature film, or these are the list of my resume and the awards that are festivals that I've been in it's hard to sell yourself if you haven't gotten this little bit of recognition in your work you know yeah, what I mean yeah. like it's it's always tricky if you if you ha don't get your film into film festivals if you don't act, get into festivals and it always gets buried it's and like it's it's hard speaking it's, of that your film was in TIFF your, a couple of your films were at TIFF, right? Yes, yes. Now, did everything work out after that, or did you still have to hustle? And what comes from that? What opportunities came from actually coming at a film festival like that? Like well, TIFF? what comes out of that is, like, you know, you hope you get some good press and people are reviewing your film. It brings recognition. It brings recognition to you as a filmmaker and to your film. I'm talking about you in particular. Well, well I'm talking, yeah, absolutely. Well, from my experience, that's what it did for me. It, it, it um, you know... <clears throat> it created a conversation. It got people to know uh, about the kind of work that I'm doing, and and it, and it just made it more possible for me to talk to other individuals of an other of a higher echelon about what else I'm doing, and trying to find other people, and and uh, it gives it makes more it may it, it, it makes it more possible to make something more. You know what yes. I mean? Because nothing's guaranteed. Yeah. Right. So you constantly have to hustle. You never stop. Like I have friends who are much more experienced than me, been in this business forever, and and they have to hustle. They still want X amount of dollars to make their pro projects, but get this much. Yeah. And still have to do it. Yeah. It, it like you know Jacqueline McClintock. She said you know it doesn't get easier; it just becomes more possible. And that's all what it is. It's like what are you doing? You're only as good as your last project. You know. Yeah. And. You know, and and that project that your last one you did is just it's going to determine what what's a little more possible next. Interesting. And you have to be realistic about it, and you gotta be realistic with your expectations yeah. too. There's there's a lot of films that go to film festivals that we never hear about. Yes. Right. So it's still a challenge. What's the difference between those ones that go to film festivals, like big ones, like TIFF or Cannes, the ones that we hear about, and then the ones that we don't hear about? What was the difference between those films? Usually it's it's who's behind them and who made them, right? Like, you know, you have certain gems that pop up every year, right? You know, um, like Moonlight, for example. Yeah. You know, I met Barry Jenkins when he was uh, did mel medicine for melancholy and and Nervous Fighter Boy was on the, you know, crossing in the sort of, excuse me, um, uh, festival circuit. Yeah. And um, he's been trying to make films for like since that film. You know, um, no one really knew that this was like a, a, a based on a play and or you know that was written by by a writer who was you know it was the actors are, are great but only if you're in um, a certain sort of know or whatever who you be able to see them and, and know who their names are. Yeah, do you know what I'm saying? Like um, I would because I'm in it and I know a lot of actors and I'm aware of who's out there. But for the average person, they're all probably fresh faces. Yeah, a lot of the masses. And um, 
So, but that's a film that is like, okay, how many of them happened in the last year or the last two or whatever? They're, those are once in a while, right? Um, because you're competing with films with Leonardo DiCaprio in them and, and these sort of, and, and you know what I mean? It's, it's, so what the difference is, is like, who are the creators? And in this sort of space when you're trying to build who you are, making one film isn't like, Unless you're like a, t you know, to, to, to find who you are in your language and what you do and how you actually run the business with it and your creative side, it just doesn't happen now over one film. Let's talk about the business side now. Mm -hmm. So you just said you got to do some stuff business related. What sort of things are you referring to? Well, you have to, you know, if you're lucky enough to even make your f first feature film for $200,000, you have to understand how that happened. You know, understand how you're managing your money. Yes. Because creative, what we always say is that, you know, well, a guy will say, well, I wrote a scene. It's a paragraph long. And to shoot that scene is going to cost $500,000 on a film that's $30 million, right? Like, as a creator, and, 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 and hopefully if you are thinking about I think it's what I've learned is that a lot of the great directors that I respect were also producers of their they were involved in their work. Exactly. So it's not to know how we're the, you know, crunching the numbers. It's actually understand how you can expand the money to achieve the creative vision you have. Because there are some people who can say, well, I need 10 lights to do this one scene, and some which will cost this amount. And there's some filmmakers who would be like, you know what? I'm going to use five lights instead. I'm going to use the rest of that money to get a crane for this other shot later in the film. And I want to maximize my money creatively that way. Right. So what I'm saying is understanding the business of how you are breaking down your budgets. Yes. How, what things cost to do. Because that will inform the reality of what you need to make. Yeah. You know? And as well, it, it, it also empowers you to be understand the parameters of your creativity. And I think that constantly the restraints that, were, that are always set up for the greatest of, of films that we love out there there are always creative parameters and restraints that they had to overcome and figure and make and, and come up with different yes, solutions yeah. that sometimes become like the talk of the whole movie or the thing because it wasn't supposed to be like that originally. Yeah. But they found a way. And sometimes it makes it. the film better. Yeah. The I think constraints. I think constraints, I mean, that's it. It's like if you just have all your druthers and given everything you want to do, I think it'll be, we see a lot of, you know, really self indulgent work. Yeah. You know? You know, you just mentioned that <clears throat> a filmmaker needs to know how to produce or at least should know how to produce. Doesn't need, they don't need to produce their own thing, but they should know how they it works. They should be aware. They should, they should learn <clears throat> to be aware. And I mean, listen, I mean, of, some people don't care about that. And they just want to be the, you know, this idea of this director who just says, you know, to the creative team, it's like, I want everything in here purple. So make it purple and blah, 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 blah. And then the creative team's like, well, how do we paint? We don't even have enough money to paint that. And they're like, I don't care. I just, man, I want it all purple. Um, that's one way of some people doing things. Or you can be like, hey, creative team, this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this. What can we do? Yeah. What can we accomplish? And then someone might say, hey, maybe we don't use paint. We use wallpaper. Maybe we, like, you know what I mean? Maybe we figure something out. Yeah. Or maybe it's not just purple. Maybe, exactly. you know, there's, there's some sort of conversation happening. I mean, but some people, you know, want to draw their storyboards and execute exactly what they, they board it. And they'll get, get in a tizzy when it's like, you know, it's not exactly what the, the thing is. I mean, people work differently. So now that, now that you're in this industry, you've been in it for a while, is there any misconceptions that you used to have or anything that you thought was one way that now you realize it's another? Besides how much work you have to put in, like, oh, I thought it would be easy, but it's actually really hard. Besides that. Well, one of my bigger realizations um, that I've actually had is, is more about the kind of work that's, that's created. The kind of work that is... Um, made it specifically in this country that I live, Canada, that I'm concerned about. Um, the capacity of stories and the diversity in stories, and we're hearing that word used a lot. We're hearing about a lot of institutions creating mandates and pledges to expanding their diversity and, and so on. And um, I'm finding that, you know, I was told or asked or grilled coming up with some of my projects that, you know, there isn't a, 
a market for them or that um, we don't understand or know who the audience is, right? So, uh, and we kind of create things out of experiences and stories that, that, that ring, that, that we feel, that speak to us. And, um, and, uh, and I found that, you know, as I've matured and years have gone by, like pitching projects, I spent a lot of time, and I think, I wouldn't say wasted time, but a lot of unnecessary time pitching projects over and over again, um, where, where the embracing or the world that I know, that I grew up in, in Toronto and, and have seen other places across this country, that, um, that, you know, folks actually greenlight projects don't have, you know, all the answers, you know, and there has been, there has been, there has been enough, I think, uh, welcoming arms to to stories that that kind of tell the the broader diaspora of this country. So that's what I've learned is that um, a lot of that stuff is untrue. That there is audience out there. Yeah. That people are hungry for certain stories. That we do things safely sometimes a little bit too much. That we can take some risks. Um, that. Uh, that the unknown is also something to be welcomed. Yeah. And when it comes to <clears throat> pitching, can you tell me some tips for pitching for people who are relatively new to it? How do you go about pitching a project? And who do you pitch to? Let's say, again, they've made a feature. Maybe yes. it's 20, 50K. Right. Maybe they've made none. Let's yes. just assume they've sure. made some shorts. Yes. Okay? Yes. Where do they go to pitch? Yes. And how do they pitch? Well, it depends on what you're pitching, number one. You should always, you know, out there right now, there's digital series, there's web series, there's feature films, there's documentary, there's television series, there's mini series, there's so many things you can be pitching. Yeah. Whatever project that you're pitching, you should really identify and do some homework on who you think your pitch, your project would be attracted to. Who 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 would who who might enjoy this pitch? It's not just random throwing it like I want to pitch, you know, someone who does comedy, a dramatic thing, without doing any homework. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like you have to look and do some homework of, like, so then that means, you know, people who who can possibly fund you or help you find funding for your project, whether it's an executive producer who has a bit of power and who's done, you know, X amount of television series, and you have a, a series idea or a pilot you've written or, or a premise or a project that you see and you like the, the work that they've produced, yeah. uh, then you want to get in there and meet with them to talk about your project and pitch them. Or it's uh, you want to go to the broadcaster, a broadcaster. Did um, you ever do that? Because you're doing stuff yeah, with the yeah. with I've done, I've done, I had to pitch everyone, like, you know, from producers to executive producers to broadcasters to, yeah, I was just, I was just in Los Angeles pitching like a couple of weeks ago. Um, but yeah, it's like you have to pit the reason why you're pitching someone is because you want them involved in your project yeah. or to help you make it. What's the sort of batting average when it comes to pitching? So you pitch to somebody, how often are you successful to failing? Ah, oh, boy. Well, it's <laughs> you do a lot more pitching than you actually, well, that's what I mean when I was saying unnecessary time in, in, in here. I think what I've learned is that I've been, you know, when you're young and you're naive and you're, and you're excited about pitching someone and someone welcomes you to come and you really respect them and you go and you pitch and then nothing happens. Yeah. And then you are, you, you, you kind of get, there's a bit of an adrenaline rush to even have some of these meetings. Yeah. And so they kind of repeat themselves for a year or two. Right. Uh, people want to check in, they're interested in you, but it's like, whatever, they ask to read your stuff, but you know, but nothing actually comes up. Yeah, so they're just pinging you every well, once in a while. Well, I think people are well intended. Like, you know, they're interested in a certain degree. But I think it comes down to, well, really, what can they do for you? Yeah. You know, and what else is on their slate? What else do they have ahead of your project? So you're saying one thing to be careful of is pitching to some people that will, they're not stringing you along in the sense that they're misleading you, but they can actually provide you with something and they're going to send signals of interest every once in a while and you're going to feel happy from that but eventually it'll go nowhere. you got to be real with it too because I think that here's what I've learned uh, about it is that you know you should always take a meeting 
if you feel like there's a potential thing of connecting with somebody. Yeah. I mean, some meetings, maybe you just definitely know that it, this isn't, you know, whatever, but I think you should always be open yeah. to taking a certain meeting, but then you, you should be really clocking how many times after. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, like, if someone is excited about something and interested in helping and wanting to work with you, I've learned what those feelings are. Yeah. And I've learned actually, you know, also when they're not. Is that something you can convey with some words so people can understand, or is it a feeling that's in your it's gut? It's a feeling, and it becomes like the real reaction. Like, you know, you can feel in the pitch when you're talking to somebody if someone's, you know, not engaged, yeah. engaged, whatever. You know what I mean? You can start to feel how they respond to you. Yeah. You have to be aware of that. And then some people are like, you know, oh, they're the, the, the stone-faced person who's just like this and just this to your pitch and you don't know where they feel and so on and so forth. But I think ultimately if someone's asking, hey, well, I want to read this, yeah, this material, and that's an invitation that you better send them something good. Yeah. You know? Because that's going to make or break whether you go... Uh, some people, it, there's no rhyme or reason to this, I think, in a way. I think you can get really good at pitching your ideas, but the, what makes a good pitch is how clear you are with your idea. And now let's talk about the specific numbers to failing and succeeding. What's your, I don't what's call the them failing or succeeding, okay. though. Let's right? I learning. think that because here's the thing. It's like sometimes you pitch folks. It's you, what You have to also gain confidence in, in over time as well as that. You're also, I also find that I'm, I'm even in a pitch, I'm determining if I want to work with the person too, right? Like, I have something that I feel is a, of a certain sort of caliber or something that could be something. I'm going to pitch you to see if you want to be involved in this sort of project. If you don't like it, or if you do like it, I still have to decide if you're the right person to work with. So you're still evaluating so a, the other person. Well, it's a two-way thing. Right. And I think you should, you know... Um, you want people to help you, but you want to find the right fit. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So there could be someone who's like, yeah, man, I want to work with you, and you're like, let's do this, let's do that, and the personalities and the sort of energies are completely wrong, yeah. and you're like, you're just seduced by it, you're like, yeah, okay, let's yeah. do it, and the next you know, you're making something, and you're like, having fights, and you're totally disagreeing, but you're locked in together, you sign these contracts, and yeah. blah, 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 blah. I think it's a two-way thing, yeah. and I think when you, the, the, the clearer you can have uh, the elements around your idea, you know, if you're the creative head, then talk creative. If you go into your pitches with a producer or someone who's handling the business side, you, you're rehearsed to know that this is the kind of stuff that I talk about and this is stuff that you talk about. And we can support each other that way. If you're the one person that's going to pitch everything, talk about the financing, the budget, the plan, the uh, the way you're going to execute it, and you're also talking about the creative, Yeah. then that's 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 those are two different things, right? Yeah. You have to, I think someone, is, but it's always, no one's going to say, hey, I want to work with you because you have a great financial plan. They're going to, what are you making? Yeah. So the creative idea, or just because you know how to, like, you know, I can get this actor. Well, but what are they going to do? What's the project? What are they playing in? You know, so you're always going to be hooking someone on the creative and the idea mm -hmm. first. And then you can use them. And even if you don't have the business worked out, you can invite them to help you out here pitch you because I need the help with the business. How, do, how would I go about putting this thing together that's $10 million dollars you know so a lot of filmmakers think they have to have the whole business plan there's this whole thing about you gotta have your business plan 100% perfect and they don't even know how to do business business plan but really the business plan is secondary to first the relationship and second the idea and rapport yes like if you're going to market even these mic the, the, these these labs and your labs it's the idea how much money you need to manufacture them and all that stuff. Yeah, you can. You have to go and find that out and put that in a plan. But if this isn't even a good idea, then what's the point of even doing a, a, a business plan? Yeah. Right? So it's like, and, and usually if you have a good creative, the business plan's kind of, oh my gosh, we can do this. We can do these posters. We can do these headbands. We can create action figures. We can, we can do a comic book. We can do a graphic novel. We can, there's stuff to come out of this, yeah. this creative entity. Yeah. Right? As a business. Right, like, uh, so you first have to have a, you know, figure out what that idea, what you're trying to say. What are some of the gripes you have with this industry? The gripes I have with the industry, I mean, it's something about what I've just been talking about. Um, How people feel like they don't have an audience for things. Yeah, that 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 question it bothers me um, because, you know, 
as much as I'm a, I am create something, I'm, I'm a filmmaker or a direct and stuff, I'm an audience member too. I'm not eliminating myself from the equation of projects or ideas that I'm thinking of. Yeah. I'm thinking about actually what would I kind of want to watch too or what would I want to be engaged with. And I know that there are other people like me. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, you know, or come from a certain diaspora or a cultural background or a place where they want to see stories that reflect something, you know. Um, uh, my big, my biggest grievance is, is, uh, is, is not because, you know, this business was, is, has been designed in a certain way and, you know, Bollywood is an exception. Certain places are exceptions, but, but it's, it was still a cultural movement that is still, I think, exclusive, mm -hmm. even in there. Yeah. Right? Like, um, like, how do you break into whole Bollywood? Like, I'm, there's some young kid, like... In, in some place on the streets who like dreams of breaking in there yeah but they have no family member no one around them who does it or like how do they do it yeah how do they get seen or how do they do that and and um and i think that you know green lighting projects distributing films the interest my biggest grievance in this country is on the film side is that is that um I feel like from at the top it, echelons of distributors and some broadcasters and so on and so forth, and I'm not going to name any, I, I don't know if they love the idea of, of really nurturing a culture of, of excellent filmmaking. There isn't the kind of love, I believe, for um, the filmmakers and the work here from the folks who can get it out to people. So they just pretend to love them? I don't want to say pretend. I don't, I don't want to say pretend or, 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 or what's real. I'm just saying there's not... I don't know if, they, if there's a true love yeah. for... Like, there's some people out there who are like, I love Canadian cinema. I love French cinema. Yeah. I love horror films. I love... Um, we li there's an industry here and that, that I don't know if... There, I think people care about it. Yeah, but I think there's so much. Um, there is so much um, emphasis on 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 celebrating work elsewhere that, like, when you in your experiences of TIFF, even how many came films do you hear about? that are like that that you immediately hear about yeah how many two right yeah how many do they program quite a bit yeah how many are submitted yeah like they always show the number of like how many films are submitted each right. year and how many get in yeah so 100 some odds just say 160 films are submitted yeah and they take you know 20 yeah what what, what, what about those the, the other 140 yeah right um, and not that they were good or bad or whatever, they may find different festivals, but when we're talking about something that we call the Toronto International Film Festival, yes, we do celebrate some of our filmmakers and you hear about, but, um, but I'm just saying there's a bombardment where we, it, 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 we celebrate a lot of elsewhere. And if we're, and if we're celebrating international films, a lot of them are, are, are Hollywood films even with the government here? So we were talking to yeah. the <clears throat> to the city about some stuff that Indie Film TL is doing, and they're celebrating how great they are with film. And I was like, well, I mean, Toronto's a great city for film, but all the things that they were saying is like, hey, we got uh, what's that movie? Uh, the one with Batman and stuff, Suicide Squad. Right. We got Suicide Squads here. We got this one. Yeah, you're making Toronto look like Gotham and New York and all these other things. You're getting the world to Toronto, but yeah. <clears throat> I'm interested in how do you bring Toronto to the world? Thank you very much. And that's what always I've, I've been, uh, that's been my, my mission. How we bring stories. I come from Toronto, so I'm, you know, but Spike Lee came from New York. Not that I'm trying to be Spike Lee, but he told us New York stories. Exactly. He brought New York to the world. Yeah. And, and that's what I mean about that love. It's like, you gotta love a place to want to share it. Yeah, you know, um, and not saying share like things that are 
bad or whatever. Like, I mean, in terms of like, if the film isn't good or whatever, it's just not. Yeah. But I think like the love behind it is like it's 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 not. I don't I don't I'm 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 it's I'm skeptical about it because then I would see you're skeptical of the people higher up actually having that genuine love love for, for the for it. Yeah. You know, I think we want successes. We want hits. Yes. We want. And, uh, but in order to have a success or a hit, it's like, there, you have to nurture something. You have to nurture something. And I'm, sh- and I know there are some filmmakers that like, you know, that get to make their second and third and whatever, but not a ton. Yeah. Like, you know, that, that are on a trajectory. you're like, okay, well, we're behind this individual. We think that they have great potential. Whoever does a producer or a production company or the funders are like, you know, not to be like blindsidedly just like oh they're they're good in their trick you let's just they want to make that next we don't eh, let's just let's just keep supporting them it's like no they've got something good they're moving up they're like let's make keep an eye on them and make sure that they are moving to the next level it's like it's like with i, I keep making the analogy back to athlete athletics when you're 15 years old and you're playing in a in a in a in a midget minor league at the highest echelon and you're and you're and you're good there are scouts ahead from college from junior leagues that are already having their eye on you they're tra- they're they're calculating your trajectory yeah then you get drafted or invited and you play on that level and then other scouts above are calculating your trajectory to get to the pro, to get to the highest echelon that you, they can possibly get you. That's why when you hear about these athletes and they're thanking their coaches from like when they yeah. were teenagers and right. shit. Because they were nurtured. They were actually, this idea of Chris Haddock would talk about this idea of apprenticeship. So you feel like our filmmakers aren't nurtured? Well, our generation of filmmakers. I, our generation, I mean, my, I mean, like, like I'm, I'm, I'm I don't, I just don't, I just generation. don't think it's a common thing, or has ever been. Yeah, I think I, I got to be careful what I'm saying here because there are in, individuals that do get and nurture, and I'm only talking about it because I've experienced this over the last seven seven years. Yeah, we're not saying well, there's no nurture. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's only so much an individual can do. I have a gentleman who came into my life, Michael Levine who is an executive producer who's an entertainment lawyer and we met he he's he's constantly looking for talent to nurture you see what i mean like it has to be in your dna yeah right or you have to want it and make a constant effort to be in that he's done that with me and 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 has been a consistent uh uh human being and friend and actual um, guide in this business. And everyone needs someone. Everyone does. Whether you start in a way and you make your first couple of things and, and someone recognizes and they see and they find you interesting and they call you for a meeting and then they're like, you know, what are you doing? They take a genu- genuine cons- like interest in your trajectory, mm-hmm. like I'm talking about. Like the scout. Like he's like a scout, you know? But he's also a guy who has has some clout who can actually like you know scout what? with clout yeah you know or say or call like you know the pro coach because he has a relationship with his pro coach who's great and says hey you should take a look at this guy who's coming up he's he's like he's he's an excellent player you know someone to endorse you yeah you know we need that you you and sometimes you know I'm lucky that I've had that I that 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 that's happened in my life I've been lucky that I've been able to connect with some individuals like Clark Johnson and even a great person who came into my life very early in this, Ingrid Venninger, who's a yeah. filmmaker and artist and producer, yeah. a self-contained you know, machine. That's what she is. You don't like stand in her way. Or yeah. she, even if you are, I mean, whatever. It's not going <laughs> to... She won't see you. Yeah. She's going through it. But that's the kind of early people that I was working with that, and she helped me a lot and I learned a lot from her but then her circle and people that she would introduce me to I listened and taken who how they rolled you have to learn from people you have to look at who is doing things and 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 also look at people that are going to keep you true right and honest in a certain way if that's if you're if that's if you're interested in in being that yeah. if you're not interested in that whatever but I am 
And so those individuals that I was introduced to, I was very fortunate that they gave me certain advices and, then, and then I would watch them and learn from them. You know, you have to seek some of those people too. You know, if you there's something you're crazy about, Halle Garima or whatever, or the filmmaker, maybe it seems crazy, but maybe send them an email and say you want to spend a week with them. Spend a week with them, like just hang out with them for a week? Ask them what they're doing. No. Look, you want to learn, but you have to know what you want to... I can't tell you what someone wants to learn. Like, if I was going to do that, it'd be because I want to actually be on set while they're working. It's not to just go and have coffee with them and shoot the shit. Yeah. It's to learn from them. Yeah. I don't think they need or have the time to be, like, nurturing or having coffees with people. Yeah. People are busy. Yeah. People are doing it or working. Yeah. And so, it, what are they doing that possibly you can ask yourself, is it possible? Would you be comfortable with me paying for my own plane ticket? I want to come and stay in this place for three nights and, and, and I can maybe come and shadow you on your set. Yeah. You so, know? one of the steps to mastery that we talk about is modeling. Is finding, first of all, knowing what you want, then taking massive action, but modeling somebody who has similar success to you figuring out how did they do it. This is an excellent way to model. In the olden days, it used to be apprentices. Mm. Leonardo da Vinci had an apprentice. Everybody had an apprentice back then. Yeah. I mean, sorry, he had a, a, a master, and he was the apprentice. Mm -hmm. now, now it comes, now it's shadowing, is the modern mentor-mentee relationship. Yeah. So I don't want anybody to think that um, off Mr. Officer here, it was like, you know... Handed, everything was handed to him in a silver spoon in the sense that you were lucky enough to get mentors and things like that and that's great you got you go, you were you recognize luck when you see it right mm -hmm. but what are some of the failures what are some of the setbacks you've had and how did you overcome them my biggest setback is what I really am grateful for certain uh, well Michael uh, Levine in my life too is I want to do everything and <clears throat> And my, I hold a lot of ideas in my head. And you have to organize them. You have to create critical, realistic paths. Right? Which is almost like your business plan. Like, you know, what you want to do and how much time. Because everything takes time and energy. So, you know, I used to go around with like, there are five features that I have scripts for. And I'd be pitching them all kind of thrown up at the wall like in a way and I believed in all of them but it 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 forced some people to be like well what does this guy really love he wants to make all this stuff where's his focus yeah is he all where's his focus he's all over the place you know whereas you saw it as just passion they saw it as as lack of focus absolutely and um and in a way it's like you know when you love some stories or things that you're working on and you want to and you can already imagine them already made and stuff you get a little bit excited and you want to, like, you know, in these early pitches and the cinema wise, like, you know, um, that's why it's really important to listen, think about who you're pitching to. Because I'd be pitching, like, five projects that are different to one person. And probably, you know, you know, I only should have pitched one, really selected which one, you know. Um, but it's also a point in my life where I was trying to, uh, I didn't learn how to write by any way other than writing. Mm -hmm. So it was also an exercise for me to actually write out different things that I was interested in and, and expand and, and, and grow. How did you learn to filter out, like you have 20,000 ideas and you're not sure which ones to pursue, how did you learn to prioritize? Well, I learned to prioritize them by actually having a conversation with someone like Michael, um, some closer friends and producers that I'm working with, or um, really kind of look at, because you need a few things going, because you never can... I always find that, you know, you, when my argument was when folks were like, you got too many things. I'm like, well, I need these things because I don't know what's going to happen. I can't guarantee just because I love something that it's going to get made. So why would I just focus my energy on one thing yeah. and then it fails and then I'm spent like, and I have nothing else in my, in my yeah. arsenal. I have nothing else to show for. What was the response to that? The response to that was even still with that, you can, you don't have to be pitching all five to one person. Oh, you were pitching all five to one person. Oh, I was pitching okay. my projects to a lot of people. You know what I'm saying? When I could have, I still could have pitched those five projects over five different people and only pitch one of them. Yeah. Because I was being specific. Yes. And it could have been, they don't need to know. Little yeah, secret. exactly. They didn't need to know that I had like five things going on. Yeah. 
to think that I'm scattered. So I've learned actually how to be quieter <laughs> about some of the things I'm working on until they're ready, until I know who I want to pitch them to. Yeah, I keep so. I'll work on things I'm passionate about, but I don't need to talk about. Them. I'm somewhat similar. People always want to know what different projects. I and I always mm. say I'm just I have secrets. Like you'll know when they're ready, just because I know that sometimes the passion or you feel like for me, I feel like I'm just working really hard. Yeah. But to other people, it could be like you're just wor working on too many things. Too many things. And you're, so, yeah, you're you not have to be selective on yes. what you make public. Exactly. And who you, and just that specificity of who, what you're working on, who you're pitching things to, is a practice to learn. Um, and you have to grow through that. Uh, I, you know, failures, I think, you know, I only calculate failures based on when I'm watching something that I've done and I know, but you know, hindsight's always 20 and 20, but, and you, there are other circumstances when you're doing certain things that, that are, that, that also dictate the way that something turns out. Like you can't control everything. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And um, and there was some. I would honestly say, <laughs> maybe there's something bigger, but it hasn't come to my head. Uh, failure of certain scenes that I that that I that I could have gotten a moment out of actors, or could have could have could have the scene could have jived better, or I could have paced it differently, right. or there was a different thing in there. Some more like craft have, related. It's all craft related. I can't say not failures in the sense that. I put everything on this one project and it and it, it didn't work and now I still don't see it as a here. failure. You know why? Because I mean, I spent about three to almost three and a half, four years on one project that never got made. Like, but I mean, like, I spent a lot of time on it. So what were you doing just to pay your rent in the meantime? I was doing other pro. I I do documentaries too. I you know direct some television. Like, it's like when you're trying to get a film together, cast it. You know put together the budget all this stuff it's like you're doing stuff every week but it's not like going to take up like 12 hours a day right so then you have to schedule like other things that you're working on to to, to you constantly need I think what I was looking at is the flow and rhythm you have development you have you know hopefully you know considering you've been financed you have yeah. pre-production production you have post and presentation yeah you have to look at where those projects are living in those streams in order to keep a cycle going you constantly need something in development yes unless you're so great that everything's all in production and yeah. you have all these but and you have all these scripts that have you know are ready to go yeah it isn't really the real reality yeah so you have you need so you have to clock where you are and so if you're in production then you know that something's going to go in presentation but you in order to have a flow and a rhythm you should have something in development that's going to move to that stage to that stage to that stage and it's so you need to build it's like a it's company business right? interesting it's almost you, like a miniature version of when you're editing a film and you have to have a certain workflow and you want to have like while this thing's rendering i need to be working on something else because I'll work on this in Photoshop while this is rendering yes. in After Effects. More like, hey, this thing is in post production here. Yes. Let me do the development on this. Yes. So that when this is done, it just goes. And yeah, and you need that. And I think if you think of longevity, so that you're like, you know, because other people will approach you about doing stuff, right? Like, people will call you and say, hey, I've got this project. We'd love to attach you as a director, or we'd love, you know, would you be interested in coming on as a writer? Or we, and, and so those are the things. I, I have worked in two streams. I have my indigenous cane sugar filmworks projects, and then I have myself who's also available to, uh, as a director for certain projects or be open for, someone might propose something to me that I never thought about that, that still speaks to me, yeah. that I'm, I'd be interested in doing. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I'm going to have a conversation about uh, a documentary film about, you know, I mean, I won't mention it, but someone who I think is an amazing individual and that I would love to make a film with them, but I didn't come up with that. I didn't think of doing that. Yeah. Like, I mean, I thought of a film, but someone else approached me about it. So it's something where I can work with them and they would be, you know, paying me through that sort of thing. Right. And I'm more like a director for a hire, but it's not. But I never. But it's still personal. It's still something I feel like I can contribute to. I, ha I have a, um, an interesting question that maybe you're not qualified to answer this. Yeah. But let's say there's new people. They're coming out of film school, or they yeah. just graduated, and they they want to direct their own thing. But they they're smart enough to realize I can't just direct my own thing. That's that's worth 100k right now. Mm -hmm. So at least let me work in the industry while I polish my script, while I pitch, while yeah. I do all those other things. How do they tend to get a job in the industry nowadays? It depends on what you want to do, though. Because in the job in the industry, I mean, are you talking about, like, you know, 
being a PA on set? Are you talking about you know being a camera assistant? Let's, let's take let's Are, take an example yeah. from like why don't you just say say a worry an actual worry of yours because it'll be everybody's worry. The more personal the pain, the more you know. <laughs> yeah. So I went to school for broadcast television, and they had a film section that I really fell in love with. Right. But it wasn't enough education to really get me to know the industry and how to make a film. Like I've made a couple of short films. So what I want to do is I want to try and get more experience and get into higher budget stuff so I can shadow everybody and see what goes on and what goes into it so that I can start understanding the way things work so then I can take that and go and make my own projects one day. Right. So what advice would you give to somebody like that? So with you, I think right now, yeah, I mean... It's hopeless. I, His advice is hopeless. And uh, forget no, about it. Yeah, no, good. I think you have to, I think you have to be focused, like, if you want, do you want to direct and write? Yes. Produce? Direct and write was more or less what I think I want to do, but I don't have the experience to really know yet. And I think that's my problem. I think, I think again, it's like, you know, the way that you get to... Directors are protective, and they're, they work in isolation, too, and so do writers. So I think the writing thing is kind of tricky. I think you have to... Um, you don't even get in a writing room or on a television show or to talk with a writer or, or, or be able to engage with how they work. Um, I think you have to look out for, for people who are coming to town. They have the screenwriters convention. They have things where you can actually go and engage and, 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 and pick up like certain things about writing. For pr being on set and, and learning about how production works and stuff, um, I think it would be a way of getting in touch with a producer uh, independent filmmaker uh, who's, you know, um, an Avi Fettergreen and someone who's out there doing stuff that you respect and call them up and, and, and offer to PA or to hang around and shadow and, and experience that. I think that's the, that's the, you know, again, it's like you have to try to find these individuals or ask these questions with out of your film school like you know you have instructors or apparently or so and so forth in the business or I should know a little something so posing those questions to them who would they suggest that you can possibly reach out to um, I get professors from York from like whatever sending me students all the time you know this person wants to have a coffee with you and talk about certain things they actually want to know when next time you're on set I can't facilitate all of it, so you have to be selective. My only personal mission is that I try to find one person a year that I can actually give attention to. I can't give it to everybody. So I think it's on you to actually try to find um, sets and, and, and filmmakers. It's, it's going to be hard to get on a Guillermo del Toro set. Like, that's, like, that's going to be pretty hard. So I think you know you have to do some homework and look at some independent film makers and who's doing what in the circle because it is a community, like just like the actors are. When actors are coming up, they pull together. They, you know, you go to the Fringe Festival. There's a lot of there's great, uh, excellent, experienced professionals that are in Fringe, and there's like newcomers. Yeah. And you find your community. Yeah. You have to try to find the community, and 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 the only way you get to do that is by having conversations with others who may have met somebody and, and you have to do a lot of homework, you know? Um, yeah. I don't think you need... The best experience you is is that I'll tell you for even what you're talking about coming out of film school and so on and so forth and that you may think you need to be on a set to see how someone else works and so on and so forth that before, you know... It's, it's the Nike slogan, man. You just gotta do it. You have to write a script. You have to... Find a way to make it with nothing or something, and you have to do it to learn it. It's not something you learn by watching. You only watch for so long. You can get so much out of it, which is great, but once you've collected those things, you have no idea what that's like until you're doing it. And so your practice and, and the space of you getting your experience is that you can switch your focus and, and try to make a goal of making a, a short film a year. Until you have made it big, your goal, whether you're making a Bravo fact for 50000 or something for, for not, no money at all, you have to be working on your craft. You have to be, Chris Haddock told me, like, very early on, you can't even call yourself a writer unless you're not writing, like, four hours every day. 
you have to build that ritual into writing four hours every day. He told me that I think in 2000, 2009. It's now 2017. Mm -hmm. All he found out about like, you know, around Christmas time that he was like, well, you know, uh, I wake up, I do a little smoking, I go for a walk and so on and so forth. So I found out that it wasn't really full four, four hours a day. <laughs> he read for two. The other two were designed, were, 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 was in incubating and finding inspiration. Yeah. But I took him seriously and I would, and it was exhausting because you have to train. It's like, you can't go and run a, a, a 10K run without really running five first. Yeah. Or running two. You have to build the stamina. So when he said that, I was like, I'm just straight writing? Like, what do you mean? How is that possible? I'd be exhausted after writing in an hour. And then over the years, then I was writing for two. Then over the years, I can write for three. And, and now how long can you write for? I can write for a long time now. How long? Well, how long? It depends on what I'm writing, though. It really depends. Like, I just was one way to my friend's college to do some writing uh, last weekend. And I, from waking up, uh, starting to write at around 10 a.m., I took probably about, I took a break for lunch and, and a break for dinner. I wrote from 10 a, about 10 a.m. To, to midnight. Two breaks. Wow. Yeah. And that's just, again, like you said, it's a muscle that you build. Yeah. There's the growth mindset and the fixed mindset. But that's mindset. also because I'm also under a, pre a time pressure. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I kind of had to. I had well, to. You had to push myself. One of the things that <clears throat> I feel like gets a goal done really quick is when you have stakes, like real stakes, like a deadline and other people. So, for example, for my film, I did the pre-production, production and post-production in three months, right. premiering at TIFF Lightbox. Yeah. And that was because it it already had that date down and I knew there was going to be an audience and I was like, fuck, I had to you do You had this. no choice. Yeah. You have to do it. And I would just edit. Yes. Like, I never worked as hard as I worked during those three months. Right. No, I know, I know what that feels like and it's good and you have to set those goals I for yourself. I loved it though because now you know what you're capable of. Exactly. That's why I loved actually doing television. You have seven days of prep and seven days to shoot like 55 pages and they're not like small. Like, it's, and, and so you know, you got to know how to, to go. Like you have to, it's a muscle. Yeah. Like that, that is, that is, uh, yeah. In, invigorating too. Right. Like, um, I'm going to yeah. ask one more question that you're going to answer just as fast <laughs> as you can. Okay. And you're going to tell everybody where they can see your stuff and cool. what you're working on. Yes. So I want to know, you work for television for hire and you've done stuff for the CBS, CBC, CBC. Sorry. Yes. How did that happen and what steps can other people replicate to get similar success to you like, yes so again I'm gonna say that I'm lucky that um, uh, there is a director uh, producer of very one of my favorite individuals in the in the industry his name is David Wellington and I met him uh, years and years ago and uh, there's a show called 11th hour and I was also doing a bit of acting and I was like you know, casting a show and I was shell shocked because all these amazing actors were there and I would it would be time for me to even say lines and I would freeze up. And but I just came out of the film center directing and he he's been good to me. Uh, he was, you know, you know, really involved with like Rookie Blue and Saving Hope, those two pretty big shows. And he was very genuous uh, generous with with trying to get me on to direct. So there's a very there's a lot of skepticism of I'm sure there was about me kind of films I made yeah. poetic this that can I handle television the the rigor of it can I can I can I can I rise to this because there are TV directors and there's other not everyone can do it yeah. or whatever he gave me an opportunity and I ran with it I had a really great experience and and then and then I was asked to do a, an episode of Saving Hope as well. Um, and then from there, which was pretty challenging and stuff, I learned that, you know, medical shows are pretty, pretty tricky for, for me in my head. Um, but you don't know unless, until you do them, right? Um, and, and then a show called Private Eyes through that, like you get in the mix, the people, yeah. you know, mention your name and work begets work, you know, hopefully, you know, that's the idea. 
And then, um, so yeah, I mean, even with the CB- CBC and doing 20 and Thunder, like, it wasn't an immediate, like, yes, Charles, great, let's hire him. There had to be a lot of convincing. I had to get approved, you know. And it's, again, people going to bat for me, uh, for the producers to, you know, um, the showrunner I worked with on Saving Hope or someone saying, yeah, no, we like, we, we want him on this show. Like, or there needs someone to be actually wanting to yeah. work with you, right? Um, and uh, think that you can contribute and bring something to the project. Like, I just interviewed for a show called Imposters. That's, that is a CBS. It's an American show. And, and they're going the second season. I didn't get that, 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 that job. As, and we had a great meeting. And, but I don't feel terrible about it. I got to meet, like, a great echelon of, of people that I hope to work with one day. Mm-hmm. So I'm not mad at it or anything. But also the director that they actually hired, you look at his resume. And it's like, well, I would have hired him, too. Yeah. He's amazing. Right? So it's like, you know, you have to build it and, 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 and some people are cut out for it and some people are not, right? So and it's and it's and it's a hard thing to crack because I know some great filmmakers of friends of mine who've been trying to crack into television as well and and they ha they haven't had much luck. So I, I call it luck and but also when I'm there I don't you know, I'm trying to do my the best I can. You know, so so yeah, it's 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 uh I never imagined that I was going to direct it. I never imagined that I'd be doing documentaries. I didn't even know, I didn't even really know what they were. I knew what they were to a degree, but I had no, like, plan to, like, oh, I'm making documentaries when I made my first short film. Or even when I came out of the film center. It was all about fiction scripted material. Yeah. And so, but after Nurse Fighter Boy, it was like, like, I was also offered a documentary. I was like, whoa, what is this? This is, oh, but I get to tell this story. So it's more about the stories, right? And these are different mediums to tell them. Different so, ang- different 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 sort of, you know, genres within the media to, to tell stories. So now what would be if you had to coach somebody and and let's say you're going to lose a million dollars if this person that you're coaching doesn't be- get to direct TV. What would you say what should they do step by step? Television, I think you have to be a little relentless with that space. You have to kind of really be getting, like, not being annoying, but you have to find a show or someone that is doing a show that you want to get on, and you have to be a little relentless. But you need something to show them. So you can't be, like, trying to get a, a job on a show and not be making anything. And sitting there just keep trying to get a show, but then you have no work to yeah. show people. You have to still... Do your work, whether it used to build it. You have to get your fil- your short. If it's a short film, then it's gotta it's gotta do well. You gotta make a really good short film, and then to have something to show and convince people, you have to keep trying to make a feature film. You getting into television is tricky because it's like majority of the individuals who even the whole you know resurgence of television, they're filmmakers. Yeah, it's the filmmakers and even the actors. There were a period when I was you know coming up, it was like. You didn't see film actors in, in television. Yeah. That was like the you know? only past 20 years. or Yeah. There's like, there's, like, there's a resurgence because there's, yeah. there's, you know, and someone had a feature film that was successful some, some you know, in festivals or whatever. And, and when they're, you know, this television show is coming, they're looking at hiring directors. They're like, oh, well, he's made that film. Oh, the, we, we see the fit. Wow. We'd love to have this person work on this, on this television show. Right? Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, so so, and you got to and you got to start with. I think you know, unfortunately, it's like to learn TV too. It's like, I did half hour comedies. You know, a couple of comedy shows, like because it's also the half hour space. Is like you have to know what that you know how that works for. Also, you're doing it at one hour. Do you know what I mean? Again, yeah. like the two K run, the five K, ten. It's, it's like to know what it's like and the demands of doing a half hour for television is yeah. important too. So if you get an opportunity. And it may not be something that you're like crazy, but it's it's something for you to exercise your muscle. Then go for it, yeah. You know, and 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 see what it's like. So start with small TV things. Now, what what are these well, small TV things? Like, <coughs> there's obviously the big ones. Like let's say Saving Hope is, is right. relatively big for most newcomers. No, yes. they're not going to let a newcomer no, direct. No, right? so let's say they have a portfolio. You have some short films, <coughs> maybe even a feature. Mm-hmm. Where did they go to? Do they just message TVO and then they're no, like, No, hey. no. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. This is like the whole thing. It's like you, you have to start to think about things like agents, right? 
um, you have to get a, you know, look, we're trying to get a director agent, you know, because they're the ones who are getting called or negotiating or knowing or understanding what shows are coming and, you know, a representative who has a roster of directors that are working, they have a rapport with, you know, the showrunners and, and, and producers of, of the television shows. So when they get, you know, on their roster of directors, they probably have, you know, these two directors are working always on this show and that these directors work on that show. And you want to meet with them because you hopefully want to, you know, have a meeting and say, I'm looking to pursue this sort of career. I'm a filmmaker, but I want also television and, and have a conversation with them. What do I look at my work? And if they take you on, then, you know, look at my work and what do I need to do? What's the next short film that I need to do that will actually attract Interesting. People? What kind of film do I need to make that's going to, um, you know, or web series, or what can I develop on my, on my own? See, see, now, what's interesting about that mm -hmm. is that what we advocate at Indie Film TO, let's say you're doing something for an audience, is to always think of your audience first, mm -hmm. and, then, and then create something for them. Obviously, that doesn't mean selling out. Like, don't just create mm -hmm. whatever your audience wants. It has to follow both your passion and what the audience would like. Yeah. But then here... Your advice is like the audience is the people that are going to hire you. What sort of thing would I have to create so that it would attract That's them? That's your audience. Your audience isn't like your mother and your father. You're uh, as a creator, as a filmmaker, your audience is the people who make who get things done. My audience, my audiences are the broadcasters and the producers and the showrunners. That's my audience. When they look at they that's what I'm making uh, in the echelon of like making stuff and knowing that yeah. like, that's the audience um, the marketing plan and how you get it out to the world and all that stuff that's, that's kind of a distributor's job right so you can actually ap approach this 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 industry like you're making socks and socks that for a certain you know audience yeah to cater to, mm -hmm. but a lot of that shit has failed. That's why we have a lot of sequels and prequels and, mm -hmm. and remakes, um, because you're still trying to find something that fits. The most innovative thing is when someone comes up with something that no one's ever thought about, that has attracted an audience. Get out. No one saw that coming. It found its own audience and beyond what other everyone expected, and no one wanted to make that film. So it's like you can try to find know what on it. You have to actually line it up at a certain point, but it shouldn't be, you know, I think that's a formula that doesn't work because if that was really the case, everyone would be freaking making millions of dollars. If you were smart enough to know what the audience will want, it can make something that's going to be whatever. That's what Hollywood studios try to do. Yeah. That's why when, before they make a film, they'll have a whole focus group come in. Yeah. And they'll provide the creative team notes based on those focus group notes. The film could still flop. Mm -hmm. So we can go the you know the Moneyball way of trying to like statistically figure this out. Yeah, but people aren't. People move to it. People will, will watch a cat beating a little thing for hours. They'll make more interested in that than watching something that's riveting, moving, going to educate them and inspire them. You know, so I think you have to, I come from the creative space and I'm like, be true to that and the audience will come because I also work in advertising where a client will come to us with matchsticks, a brand of matchsticks idea. But these matchsticks do something a little bit different than the other ones. My job working in advertising as a creative director is to think about how to get that to the masses. Yeah. I don't, I have to obviously know who's into matchsticks, mm -hmm. but then I have to present something special to them to hopefully not just have those people who like men, but other individuals. We, I find that the film and television industry is one that we spend so much money, so much money is expended in it, and <laughs> we do very little in marketing and promoting in a creative manner with finding audience. It's like, we're making this and it's going to fit this audience that already exists. Yeah. Broadcasters are like, you know, our demographic is this, then we have to make things that fit this. Well, what about the idea of attracting a broader demographic? What about, you know, making effort because on certain channels, I mean, 
I mean, even Netflix. I mean, you have the variety of everything there. Everything. So, you know, you have different time slots and broadcasts and, and normal television, whatever, where you have a show that, that caters to this thing. Then you get a lot of people coming to the network. Not just because you make one thing. Like BBC, they make various things and they have various at people tune in at different hours. So I don't think you can... There's a lot of people. There's like 2 million some of people in Toronto alone. Mm-hmm. Plus. It's like 3 three million in the GTA, I think. In the GTA. That's, yeah. that's a lot of people. You know, go across the country. Um, you know, but what do people like? And what are they into? You know, I think you have to be aware of what you're making, what audience you're channeling towards. But I think, you know, it's good to try to think who else you, you get your target and then you have your like you have your core you can target you, like who are you targeting yeah. right so all these things are factored in but but I think creatively no one's an expert on knowing all that stuff if someone has a secret then I mean they're holding it to themselves uh, so I think there's you still have to be passionate about story not oh I'm going to make a genre film because I know I'm going to like I mean that could be your angle I would make, try and make another saw and become a millionaire and do like seven of them and be rich and then like, you know, just duplicate that stuff. Sure. Something's worked with that. Try to follow and study and do that model. But that to me is fraudulent. There's nothing original about it. Unless you're going to really kind of do something with it. If you're only doing this in a model of like how to make money and do what someone else did, sure. That's, 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 that's cool. But if you have stories that interest you, that you don't exist, that haven't been told, that you can share with the masses with this medium, psst, why not go for that? You know. Anyway, so Charles, yeah, I really, you, I really appreciate it, and I want you, you, yes, on that, on ending on that, which yes. is very inspirational to me, because I'm of the latter camp, which I just care about. How can I influence people to change in a certain way, or I want to tell my story in this way? I don't necessarily care about the money, but the money will come usually from those people who don't care about it the most. Right, which is kind of a sad thing. Yeah. In my view. Yeah. But I think it's like, yeah, I don't know. There are different ways, but yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so where can people find out more yeah. about what you do and what projects are you working on? Right. Well, I have a little website called canesugarfilmworks.com. I mean, it's an update there of like things that have in development. Uh, it, things that are completed, things that are in production, the stages of those projects. Currently right now, I mean, we just, uh, yesterday, um, uh, the premiere of a, a television series I worked on called 21 Thunder, um, uh, on 21 Soccer Academy, set in Montreal. It is kind of like our Friday Night Lights and, um, and really proud of the show and the talent and the young cast that people haven't seen before. Um, yeah, so that airs and that's on so every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, tune in to watch that. You'll, I think, I think you'll dig it. I directed episode three, four, and six um, out of the eight. And uh, right now, I'm uh, I'm in production on a, a feature documentary called uh, Invisible Essence, which is based on the world-renowned no- novella The Little Prince. So I'm in production on that. That'll be ready and, and out in the world in 2018. And then I'm uh, adapting a Mordecai Richer novel called Son of a Smaller Hero into a four-part miniseries. So I'm writing that right now as well. 